Hallelujah, hallelujah. Well, you may be seated while you're being seated. If somebody is next to you, just look at them with your eyes real big and say, I'm glad to see you at church. I'm glad to see you at church. Man, can we give God praise for our worship team just for leading us into the presence of the Lord? Listen, I just believe that something special is going to happen today. I believe that God is already moving. And as you know, we are a church that believes in following the flow of the Spirit. While we have different things planned and while we have things produced and we're ready, we are ready, number one, to follow the Spirit of the Lord. And so today, as we even flow into this today, I just want to ask you just to invite Holy Spirit in in a new way today. I want to invite you just to expect something different today. I want to invite you just to open your heart up to receive what God has for us because we're not just here to hear a preached word. I believe deliverance happens even in worship. Deliverance happens even as we come in here and we're praying. So I'm excited that you're here today. Thank you for registering. Thank you for being here. Thank you for complying and wearing your mask today because I believe that even with masks on, we can give God all the praise and all the glory. Amen? Amen. Well, I'm going to jump right into this message because I believe we have something special that God wants to do in and through us today. And if you're going to be following us today, uh, if you're here for the first time, we welcome you. We thank you for being here with us. And if you're returning and you've just been coming for a little while, we thank you for being back with us. What we do is we try to make it very easy for you to follow along with us. And we have what we call our YouVersion Bible app. It's not ours. We didn't create it. We're just utilizing it. But we put our sermon notes and our message notes right there. There's instructions on the screen behind me. If you want to follow along, you can find it right there on your phone. But I'm excited. I'm really excited today because as we were even in corporate prayer today, we really asked Holy Spirit to come in an unusual way, to come in a way that we felt his tangible presence. And I believe that as we continue even in this series called Greater, we're already seeing a foreshadowing of how he wants to move today. We absolutely are living in a time where things are a little bit different. We're living in a time where the climate is just a little unpredictable. And as I've been kind of, you know, walking even this past week, I've been really sensitive to what God is doing. I've been really sensitive to even how people are feeling in this time. Yes, we have a pandemic that we know is very, very much real and that it's out there. But I believe that if we can trust in the Lord, even through the world operating in fear in a pandemic, we can operate in faith. And as we're walking through this, I believe that as we are those thermostats, we are the one who actually guide the temperature of the world, the world needs to see the church show up in force, believing that he is God and he is the one who continues to keep us. So as we're walking through this today, I want to just remind us, because in this series called Greater, this series is really just to give us a reminder of who God is to us, And then how he wants us to show up in a greater way to the world. And if we can believe that everything God said is true, we can actually grab this word and we can walk it out. Now, I said something in the very first week of this series that I want to remind us of. And I'm going to have you help me in a minute, but I want to remind you of what I said. The first week I said that we have a great God that gives us great hope because he gives us great promises. Can you repeat that after me? We have a great God. Come on, say it with your chest. We have a great God that gives us great hope because he gives us great promises. And if we believe that, we need to let that sink in. If we believe that, that means everywhere we go, everywhere we show up, all that we do, we can walk with that assurance that we're not out here operating as the world does without any hope. We're out here in a different fashion with a confidence that who God said he is, is absolutely who he is. As a matter of fact, I don't have this in your notes, but you can write this down. Numbers 23, 19 from God's word translation tells us something that I like to remind us of. It tells us that God, number one, is not a man. And the reason why I'm excited to say that he's not a man is that because when he's not a man, that means he cannot do what man does. He cannot lie. He cannot disappoint. I'm going to read this scripture to you because as I was meditating on it this morning, it just grabbed me, and I shared it even this morning in corporate prayer, and I think this is going to be helpful for you as well. It says this. It says, God is not like people. He tells no lies. He is not like humans. He doesn't change his mind. When he says something, he does it. When he makes a promise, he keeps it. 
I have received a command to bless. He has blessed, and I cannot change it. Can somebody say amen to that? I'm encouraged because we serve a God who does not even have the ability to lie. So when we see something in his word, we can hang our hats on it. We can take it to the bank. We can put all of our wages on it because he is the one we have confidence in. And as we are talking about this, I want to tell you another great thing that we can actually bank on is that God does not believe in just staying the same. What do I mean by that? God is a God of improvement. The Bible says he goes from glory to glory and from faith to faith, which means if you saw him in a certain way last week, don't sit there and think he's just going to show up in the same way this week. What he actually wants us to do is to challenge him. The Bible says, prove me and watch when I open up the windows of heaven. God is saying, if you will trust me, even with things going around you that look a little bleak, if you will trust me, I'm going to show up in a way because I believe in adding value to my word. I believe in adding value to your life. And the foundational scripture that we are actually using for this particular series is Haggai chapter 2 verse 9. And let me read the first part of it. It says this, the glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. What he's saying right there is that something's improving. The latter thing, now this thing that's coming now is actually going to be better than what you've experienced. It goes on to say, and in this place, I will give peace, says the Lord of hosts. Now, this scripture, while it was what we chose to actually utilize for this particular series, I heard this scripture in a different way this week. This scripture turned into more than words on the page, and it became prophetic revelation to me. Because as I heard this, what it said to me is that back when this was spoken by the prophet Haggai, he was speaking about a temple made with hands. He was speaking about a temple that people would come to, and they would actually come around each other to worship God. But in the New Testament, the temple that we're talking about is, touch yourself right quick, touch yourself. The temple that we're talking about is this temple. So what encouraged me as I was reading this scripture was that when he said the glory of this latter house will be greater than the former, what he was actually saying to us is that the glory and what I described the glory as as the manifested presence, the manifested demonstration of God, the glory, the manifestation of this temple will be better than the one that was former. Somebody say I'm getting better. Come on, if you believe it, say I'm getting better. We are getting better, and we can actually hang our hats on the fact that God is not looking for you to operate in the same thing that he showed you last year. Some of y'all thought 2019 was good, and when you came into 2020, you said all hell broke loose. But what I'm here to tell you is that even though hell broke loose in 2020, I still believe that we have a great God that gives us a great hope, that gives us great promises. That we have a God who can do anything but fail. And as we operate in that faith, we can hold on to his promise. Now, here's a major point of emphasis that I want to give us today. And I want us to grab this. This major point is that God wants us to represent him in the earth. The reason why I'm saying all this is because if we don't understand that he's equipping us so that we can go out and actually show the world how to live, we will just operate in religious exercise. But when we can understand that not only does God want us to represent him, I'm going to break this down. He wants us to represent him. He wants us to represent him. See, when you use re, what it is saying is that to do it again or to take it back to the original intent. So even though there are things that caught us by surprise in the earth, none of this caught God by surprise. So what he's saying is that people have now lost their faith in me, but I need the church, the light of the world, the salt of the earth, to show up and now re-present me. So even when things look a little bleak, come on the scene and re-present me. When you're at your job, re-present me. When you're on Zoom and everybody's looking like they're bored out of their mind, you put a smile on your face and say, I'm going to re-present God right here in this meeting. Because the world needs a guide, and we need to be that guide. I was thinking about this this week, and I remember when we used to wear those bracelets that said WWJD. Y'all remember those? It was supposed to be a reminder that when we kind of got out of God's character, we can look down real quick and say, what would Jesus do? And many times that would be a good reminder. 
But what if I told you, I need y'all to stay with me for a second. What if I told you that doing what Jesus would do is actually not the full will of God? Some of y'all looking at me with those eyes like, I don't know what you're talking about today, preacher. What if I told you that when you actually did what Jesus would do, that you were actually disappointing God a little bit? Come on. What we're looking at is that we have to understand that even though that might sound like blasphemy, it's the absolute truth. Let me show you something. Check this out. John chapter 14, verse 10, it says this. Don't you believe? This is Jesus. He says, don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I speak are not my own, but my Father who lives in me does his work through me. Somebody say through me. Just believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. Or at least believe because of the work you have seen me do. See, right here, what Jesus is saying, he's saying the works that I'm doing, they're actually testifying that I am of the Father, and the Father is of me. The works that you see me doing, the miracles, the signs, and the wonders that you see me do, they are actually an affirmation that the power of God is on me, and I'm actually God walking in the earth. But he goes on to say this, and this is the part that I want us to grab, especially for today. He says, I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done. And here it is. And even greater works, because I am going to the Father. Greater works, because I am going to the Father. And that's what we're talking about today. We are focusing on greater works. Because as the scripture says it right there, we are not simply to repeat what Jesus did. We're to repeat in the, way, in the fashion of the model, but we're actually to do greater. And as we look at this, you might be saying, whoa, preacher, whoa, Mo, those are big words. Jesus did a whole lot of things. Let me tell you some of the things he did. All the way up to even this part in John, Jesus had turned some Fiji water into a nice Cabernet or a Merlot, whatever one you like. He's read the mind of a Samaritan woman. He's healed an official son. He healed a man crippled for 38 years. He turned two pieces of tilapia and a few loaves of Hawaiian bread into a supernatural fish fry. He fed 5,000 people. He walked on water. He healed a man born blind. He raised Lazarus from the dead after he had been dead for, thir- for three days. And now he turns to his disciples and say, I want you to go do those things. And not only do I want you to go do those things that I did, I want you to do greater than I have done. And what I was doing, when I was reading the scripture, I heard this not just as a suggestion, I heard this in my spirit as a declaration that Jesus is saying, yes, I've shown you the model of just what's possible. But not only do I want you to follow the model, I want you to take that model and I want you to put it times 10. I want you to 10x this thing. I want you to make sure you know that the power that I've operated in, all I was doing is giving you an example of what was possible in your life. And I can imagine that the disciples were looking at Jesus kind of like, bro, Do you not know what you did? We're just men. We're just fishermen. We're just taxpayers. We're we're these people that are just out here trying to follow Jesus. But what I believe is that if we can grab hold to the fact that Jesus said, no, 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 don't settle for just being merely men as men see it. Understand that I'm putting super on your natural. Understand that when you accept my call, that you can walk in this thing in a greater way. So as we're looking at this, We need to understand, as we grab it today, that God wants us to do greater. Can you say that with me? God wants us to do greater. That's important because never before, hear me, never before in the history of the church has the world needed the church to be the church. Never before, like today, has the church needed to show up in great form. Even in the time, there are a lot of people who are discouraged. There are a lot of people who are depressed. There are a lot of people that are, that are disconnected. 
And as I was thinking about this, the reason why this word is so important is because if we're not careful, this is something I've been feeling that's just kind of been hovering over us, not just in this church, but I'm talking about in society. If we're not careful to embody what Jesus wants to do through us, what we will do is we will start operating in a spectator spirit. That might not be something you read in the book, but the Lord spoke to me this week and said, my people have to come out of spectating and be participators. And what he's saying to us right here at Victory Midtown is that if we can grab this, if we can hold on, if we can understand that even things that look bad, we can show up on the scene and change it. He doesn't want us just to watch it. He wants us to do the greater works. And as we're talking about this, I know you may be saying, all right, Mo, I hear you. I know the Bible even said it. I know, you know, we had a great worship set and we set the tone for a great time today. But I don't really know how I can actually do those greater works. Let me show you. Let me walk you through just a few ways of how we need to walk through and set ourselves up to walk in his greater works. Number one, we have to operate from a place of knowing that we have the greater message. We have the greater message. Now, carefully hear this. When I say that we have the greater message, what I mean is that we are able to live in the fulfillment of the message that Jesus preached. What this means is that we now have the opportunity to live in the message of the fulfillment of the kingdom of God, which means that when Jesus was on the earth, he was showing people, he was talking to people in a way that he was trying to remind them or show them that he was God in flesh and that he was actually the fulfillment of prophecy. But for us, we have an advantage. Somebody lean in with me real quick. If you're new here, just lean in with me. Just follow me, follow me. The person all the way in the back over there, I see you back there, lean in with me. What is the greater message that we have? This greater message that we have is the message of the kingdom. This greater message that we have is the message of the kingdom that we already know how the story ends. This message that we have, that we can have confidence, is the message that even though hell looks like it's breaking out around us, we can say, I've already read the book of Revelation. I'm not sitting here waiting to see if we win. Somebody say, I win. Come on, say it with your chest. Say, "I I win. We win. And if we can understand that, what we will then do is start operating from the place of our victory instead of trying to walk seeing if we're going to win. And God is telling us as we're walking in this greater, he wants us to have a confidence that God can do anything but fail. And let me make that personal. A lot of times we say that, we say God can do anything but fail. But as I say we're doing greater works, that means you can do anything but fail. That's a word for somebody in here. You got to have a big meeting this week. You have a big encounter this week. You have some things that you're working on, and you have low self-esteem thinking that you're operating in your strength. But God is here prophetically speaking through me that you can do anything but fail. If you believe that, I need you to put your hands together in here right quick. So as we're thinking through this, as we're walking through this, these are some of the things Jesus was trying to show them as he was trying to break this down. Jesus was trying to let them know that the Old Testament things you walk through, The old things that you thought you needed to actually point to prophetically, I'm showing up in him. What he was saying is that I am the ram in the bush when Abraham went to sacrifice Isaac. What he was saying is that when Jonah was in the whale's belly for three days, it was a foreshadowing of the tomb, him being in the tomb for three days. When a spotless lamb was sacrificed in the temple, it was pointing to him being the spotless, sinless sacrifice of God. The blood uh, placed over the doorpost in Egypt, it was protecting them from the spirit of death, and it represented the spirit of life that Jesus gives us by the sacrifice of his blood. So all of these things, they were a foreshadowing, but now Jesus said, I am here. I am actually that promise that was to come. I'm showing up right here on the scene, and not only am I showing up on the scene again, I need you to show up as I do in the earth. So here it is. We now have the full message. We now know that it has come to pass. And again, as I was even going over this message this week, the Lord just kind of stopped me and he said, write this down on your notes. He said, write this down and let people know that it has come to pass. That for somebody in here where you've been in a long season, the Lord has been downloading to me right now. You've been in a long season of struggle. 
You've been in a long season of second-guessing yourself. You've been in a long season of trying to get your self-esteem together. You've been in a long season of going and feeling like you're climbing uphill. But I'm here to tell you as an announcement that it has come to pass. It has come to pass. I don't know where you are in this room or if you're going to even be watching this later. It has come to pass. And the reason why it's important for us to know that it has come to pass and that the prophecy of Jesus has come to pass is that we have an advantage that all the prophets of old, that all the New Testament people that wrote this Bible that we call the Word of God, that they were just talking about as something to come. They were just hopeful in this thing, hoping that as God was speaking to them, they were actually able to foreshadow what was going to happen in the earth. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Let's read together uh, 1 Peter chapter 1. I'm going to read it. I want you just to follow along. It says this. This salvation was something even the prophets wanted to know more about when they prophesied about the gracious salvation prepared for you. What he's saying right here is this salvation that we're walking in, this is something that the prophets, they actually wanted to know more about. So let's kind of have that in the context. It says, they wonder what time or situation the Spirit of Christ within them was talking about when he told them in advance about Christ's suffering and his great glory afterwards. They were told that their messages were not for themselves, but for you. Touch yourself right now. Say, for me. And now this good news has been announced to you by those who preached in the power of the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. It is also wonderful that even the angels are eagerly watching these things happen. What the scripture is telling us right here is that we are even more blessed than the prophets of old. What the scripture is telling us is that this is not a historic document that we read as the Bible, but we're able to actually walk in this because the prophets, they were just messengers to bring it forth. Moses, Isaiah, Elijah, Daniel, Michael, Malachi, all of them, they were just trying to tell us something that they would actually never see. But the advantage that we have as a body of believers is that not only can we read this, we can receive it, and then we can walk it out. We can read it, we can receive it, and then we can live it. Because as we have victory in Jesus, as we talk about having a greater message, what we're not saying is that we have a better version of the message. But what we're saying is that we have more range for the message. What we're not saying is that you're sitting here looking at, okay, God did this and now I'm going to do it better. What we're saying is that we're giving now a wider variety of opportunities for people to receive what God has for them. So as we're looking at this, let me show you how important you are. Matthew chapter 11, verse 11, it says this, I tell you the truth, all of you who have ever lived, none is greater than John the Baptist. Yet even the least person in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he is. Again, I keep saying this and I keep bringing it, but I want you to know that in the Old Testament, in the Old Covenant, John the Baptist was looked at as like this greatest person. He was the one who gave the foreshadowing to Jesus. But because we have the kingdom message, because we know the end of the story, now even the person who will just get saved and give their lives to Jesus today is even greater in the kingdom than John the Baptist was because we have the fulfillment of life. So as we're looking at this, I want us to grab this. This is the message that we carry. We carry this message of hope. We carry this message that God gives us the opportunity to be the salt and the life in the earth. Amen? Let me go to number two. The second reason that we're able to walk in greater works is that we have the greater ministry. We have the greater ministry. So I've already kind of set it up and said, okay, it's not about a deeper ministry. It's about a wider ministry. We have a greater ministry than Jesus. Let me tell you why. We have a greater ministry than Jesus because Jesus, even in his three and a half years of his ministry, he never left Palestine. Jesus, in his three and a half years of ministry, he never left more than 60 miles away from home. Some of you in here, this year, you've already traveled farther than Jesus ever traveled in his whole life. So what he's saying to us is a lot of times we put this thing on the shelf and we say, Jesus, you're the only one that can do it. And he's saying, I have equipped you now. I've given you the opportunity to now do way more than I can do. 
Because Jesus actually gives us this opportunity and he gives us his mandate to say greater works, what he's saying is that just like Peter in Acts 2, he prayed, he preached, and 3,000 people came to Christ. In one day, Peter was able to, to preach and actually bring more people to God than Jesus did in his whole ministry. This weekend, right here from this room, and because of Instagram, and because of Facebook, I will actually minister to more people in this day than Jesus ministered to in his whole life. So that's not just for me. That's for you as well, wherever God is calling you to go. You need to understand that I'm carrying the gospel with me. You need to understand that I'm carrying this potential to operate in greater. Because what we're saying is that we're not saying that the content of what we do is better, but we're saying that we're stretching the extent of what we do. We're not saying we have a better version. We're saying we have a wider portion. So as we walk in this, let me show you something. As we're reconciled to God, Jesus did his job. So we have to do our job. What is our job? Matthew 28, verse 18, Great Commission. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Again, Jesus is just saying, go. He's kicking us out the roof. He's kicking us out of the house. He's kicking us out of staying with our parents right now. He's saying, go. Go and do what I told you to do. Go and be the answer into this world. Because we are to give range to the change that Jesus began. We are to give range to the change that Jesus began over 2,000 years ago. And if we will grab that, what we will understand is that as we're walking, we have a responsibility. And that responsibility is not to let the gospel just be held up on the inside of us. The responsibility is that wherever we find ourselves, wherever God has you show up, you have the answer for that issue. Wherever God has you show up, I don't care if it's in the gym, I don't care if it's in the boardroom, I don't care if it's in the elevator, you have the answer because you're putting feet to the gospel. Just yesterday, I was on the elevator, and anybody that knows me knows that you're not going to get on the elevator, even through COVID season, and not speak to me. I'm going to talk to you. I'm going to say hello. I'm going to wave at you three and four and five times until you say hey back. I'm going to step in front of you if you act like you have your earbuds on. I'm going to say, hey, how you doing? Why do I do that? Because I believe when I show up, things change. I believe that I'm carrying something that people need. I believe that I'm not trying to be obnoxious, but I'm trying to get you freedom. I believe that even when you're looking a little sad, that's why I wear my mask with my smile on. You're going to know my, my face is smiling, even if I show up and you can't see me. And I'm saying, how are you doing? Yesterday, I was on the elevator. This guy, he was on there. He was trying to give me the straight off. He was trying to give me the Heisman. And I said, hey, man, how you doing? First, he was like, I'm here. And I, what I didn't do is just stop right there and say, okay, God bless you. I said, what's going on? How you doing? And he said, man, every day almost seems like the same day. And right there, see, I'm going to show you something. I'm going to give you a little trick. You don't have to spend two hours to be a prophet. Right there in that moment when I was on the elevator, I said, man, you're going to have a greater day and a greater week this week. Immediately when I said that, his whole countenance started to change. Immediately when I said that, he stepped off the elevator with a little pep in his step. So now the next time I see him on the elevator, even if he tries to give me the Heisman again, he's going to know, no, he's going to speak to me. He's going to call life out of me. He's going to make sure that I know that this is a great day by prophecy, even if it's not by matter of fact. I want you to know that wherever you go, you are giving range to the change that Jesus began over 2,000 years ago, and he wants us to embrace it. How many people are going to embrace that call this week? Come on, you don't have to lie to me. Raise your hand, clap your hands, whatever you want to do. It's going to be a great week. That's what I'm talking about. But here it is. As we're walking through this, this shows us this last thing that I want to show us in reference to doing the greater works. In order to do the greater works, yes, we can know, have all the knowledge. Yes, we can have all the inspiration. But the only way that we can have the greater works is that if we understand that we have the greater power. We have to understand that we have the greater power. 
Now, I know how popular this is in this day and age. I'm not talking about some self-sufficient power. I'm not talking about this power of thought, the power of now. I'm not talking about, you know, channeling your chakras and all of this type of stuff. What I'm talking about is that without the help of the Spirit of God, it is not possible to do greater. Without the help of the Holy Spirit, it is not possible to do the greater that we're talking about today. See, the facilitator of the greater is the Holy Spirit. The facilitator of that first and that second thing I told you is the Holy Spirit and us operating in the the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the embracing of the Holy Spirit. See, as I was thinking about this, I remembered and I realized these few things. Number one, I said, one of the reasons so many Christians find themselves failing in an attempt to be good Christians is because we try to do it in our own power. One of the reasons we find ourselves in cycles, choosing the same type of man over and over again, choosing the same type of woman all over again, even when you know it's not healthy for you, is because you're yielding to your sense and not his sense. One of the reasons why we fail and we're in this cyclical nature of of deprivation is that God is saying, I've given you help, but will you ask me for my help? Will you employ my help? Will you receive my help? It is the Spirit of God that gives us the ability to do the greater, and he provides us with the tools to do it. Now, let me tell you something, because somebody might be getting a little nervous. I want you to hear this. The most important message to the unbeliever is Jesus. No cap, no no argument with that. But once you receive Jesus, the most important message that you need to receive is the message of the Holy Spirit. Once you receive Jesus and your soul is saved and you're secure in your eternal salvation, the next thing that you have to understand is that Holy Spirit has come to help you. Acts 1.8, this is a scripture that our whole vision here at Victory is actually founded on. It says this, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Real quick summary, what we say about that is that this allows you to love your neighbors, this allows you to love your family, this allows you to love people that don't look like you, and this allows you to go to the nations and impact it for Jesus. But the caveat in this scripture, if you read it and you read it slowly, he says, you will be my witnesses, but he says, then you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. So what he's saying is that, yes, I've given you a mandate to do something, but you don't have the ability to really do that until you actually receive the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. So I'm answering the question for somebody in here in the room that you said, I've been doing my devotionals. I've been in a small group. I've been going to church. I've been watching church online, even through the the quarantine. Why am I not operating in this power that I see as promised to me? It's because we've kept Holy Spirit over here on the side. We kind of called him the forgotten God. We talk about God the Father. We talk about God the Son. But we don't talk much about God the Holy Spirit. We allow people to lie to us and say, oh, if you speak in tongues, you're a fanatic. We allow people to talk to us and say, oh, you know, that's weird or I don't want to do that. No, I'm sitting here letting you know that if we can embrace the fullness of what God's promised to us, there is no weapon that is formed against us that is able to prosper. There is nothing that we cannot do because the Bible says greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Part of that notion is that Holy Spirit needs to live in you so that you understand that power that you have. So as we're walking through this, let me read this to you in John chapter 20. This is Jesus giving us a little key. He says, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. When I read that, it was like Jesus was saying, receive this help. It's like, you know, somebody giving an alley-oop saying, I got you. If you would just trust me, receive this help. Listen to this. God's ability is available to us all. There's a quote by A.W. Tozer. He says it like this. I I love how he captured it. He says, the spirit-filled life is not a special deluxe edition of Christianity. It is part and parcel of the total plan of God for his people. What that means is that it's not just for the preacher on the platform. 
Holy Spirit is not just for the people on the worship team. Holy Spirit is not just for the person who went to seminary or Bible school or who reads their Bible so much. Holy Spirit is for all of us to allow this power to work from within us to an outward world that needs to see us demonstrate greater works. And as we walk through this, I'm going to give you a couple quick things that you can go back and study later, but I need you to get this because this is the fullness of what we're to walk in in our arsenal. There's a Holy Spirit attribute that works in us, and then there's a Holy Spirit attribute that works out of us. There's an indwelling, and then there's an outpouring. You can't do this outpouring that I'm talking about until you first receive the indwelling. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, it talks about the nine fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These things are important because these are the things that keeps us from being anointed jerks. Let that sink in for a second. You've encountered those people. They're super anointed. They can preach. They can sing. But you meet them in the grocery store, and they're jerks. They can give you the word, but they can't give you the time of day. They can walk around, and they can, you know, wear their T-shirts and say, God over everything. But then when you see them, they're acting like they don't see you. You can't have an outpouring of the Holy Spirit until you first allow him to have an indwelling in you to change you. And the second thing is that we have to operate and embrace the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, which is the Holy Spirit working through me. It's what sometimes is called the power gifts. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7 through 11, it says it's the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, the gift of faith, the gift of healings, working of miracles, prophecy, discerning of spirits, different kinds of tongues, and the interpretation of tongues. And what I'm here to do even in this moment is to demystify the Holy Spirit, to demystify someone, yes, someone who has been trying to come with you and walk alongside you and in you for quite a long time. As I'm in here even right now and I'm preaching this message, I'm sensing that some of us in here, we've wanted to step into a new dimension with God. But we've been afraid because someone has given us a false narrative about Holy Spirit. And today, as we talk about these greater works that we want to show up in in the world, we need this Holy Spirit. We need both the fruit and the gifts in this world today. But what we have to do, we have to eagerly desire. We have to eagerly desire the Holy Spirit. And when we eagerly desire it, we then can say, God, come into my life. God, I know that I've given my heart to you, but I want to give the fullness of who I am to you. And I want to receive and embrace the fullness of who you are to me. I was hearing this as I was preparing this week, and I I, I felt like God was saying to us, Holy Spirit is like the cheat code for the believer. Holy Spirit is like the cheat code. If If you play any video games, if you grew up around the time when I grew up, there was this game called Contra. And to this day, I still remember the cheat code. Up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, B-A, B-A, start. I haven't played that game in 20 years. But that cheat code was so important to me that it was ingrained in my psyche. That cheat code was so ingrained in me that even out of my sleep, I can say that cheat code. Holy Spirit is saying, have you ingrained my presence in you so much? That no matter what's going on, you don't have to wait and go get a preacher. You don't have to wait and go get a minister. You don't have to wait and go get a worship leader. Right there where you are, you can employ me because I'm right there with you and in you. Employ your cheat code. Employ your cheat code. Every believer has access to the Holy Spirit. And this Holy Spirit that I'm talking about, it shifts us from being timid to being bold. It shifts us from being someone who's shy to being one who walks in authority. It shifts us from one being self-conscious to being one who stands in confidence in the things of the Lord. As a matter of fact, this cheat code, it puts super all over your natural. 
Benson Andrew Idaho, so he said it like this. He was called the father of Pentecostalism in Nigeria. He said, my discovery is going to be your discovery. If we do not have the supernatural in Christianity, we have nothing to offer the heathen but a religion. And true Christianity is not a religion. We are called to do greater works. We are called to show this world how we're to walk this thing out. And today, what I want to do, some of us in here, many of us in here may have already received the Holy Spirit. Many of us are already baptized in the Holy Spirit. For some of us, this is the first time you've even heard anything about this. But I want to let you know, you don't have to rev up to receive Holy Spirit. I want to let you know, in a moment, God can allow you to be baptized in the Holy Spirit to now employ his supernatural assistance in your life. So this is what I want to do today. I want to invite us all to receive a fresh baptism of the Holy Spirit. I don't care if you already speak in tongues. I don't care if you already operate in prophecy, if you already operate in words of wisdom and knowledge. Today, I believe that God wants to do something again. Today, I believe that he wants to share something special with us that we're able now to use that range to create change in this earth. So right now, if you'll do me a favor, can I have everyone stand on our feet right now? I want you to close your eyes wherever you are. This is not spooky. This is not something that is religious. This is something that God wants an encounter with you. The prerequisite for operating in the gifts and in the fruit of the Holy Spirit is that we have to first understand that we have to have salvation in our lives. So if you're in here right now, before I pray over you for the fresh infilling of the Holy Spirit, if you have not given your life to Jesus and you want to do that now because you want the fullness of what he has for you, I just want you to lift one of your hands up to me while every head is bowed. Hallelujah. We're all covered in here. So I'm going to pray over us. And as I pray over us, I'm going to give us a couple instructions even in this prayer. And we're going to sing a song together. We're going to worship together. And we're going to sing a song that talks about how heaven is coming right here on earth. And the first thing, as you have your eyes closed, that I want you to realize, if you are open to receiving a fresh baptism of the Holy Spirit today, I want you to understand a couple things. Number one, this baptism is for you. So take any question out of your mind. It is for you. Number two, you have to desire this baptism. You have to desire the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Number three, you have to ask for it. You have to ask for it right there where you are. Before I even pray, I want you to ask Holy Spirit to baptize you. I want you to ask Holy Spirit to come into your heart. And number four, you have to do the speaking. Some of you in here, while we're singing this song, Holy Spirit is going to start coming out of your mouth. It's going to start bringing new tongues out of your mouth that you don't understand. I don't want you to fight it. I want you just to release it. Don't try to speak in English. Just receive what God is doing. So right now, in the name of Jesus, with our hands lifted in a sign of surrender to you, God, we say, Holy Spirit, we want a fresh baptism. Holy Spirit, we need you. Holy Spirit, be with us today like never before. Holy Spirit, give us the interpretation of tongues. Holy Spirit, give us words of wisdom. Holy Spirit, give us prophecy. Holy Spirit, give us your empowerment today. Father, I declare that there will be people who receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit with evidence of speaking in tongues right now in this place as we worship. Father, we lift you up. We give you praise and we give you honor in Jesus' name. Let's worship and receive the infilling of the Holy Spirit.